Hi everybody, welcome to Elmville Community Church. Um, just um, excited to do my announcements in a boat again. Uh, it's been a while since I uh, did it, so I've set it up so I can still watch my line while I uh, am uh, doing that. Hopefully you can hear my voice. If not, I'll have to redo it and uh, stop trolling, I guess. Um, anyway, if you're new to Elmville Community Church, thank you for coming. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Um, we are um, an evangelical church who um, just wants to be authentic and doesn't want to put on airs and doesn't want to try to uh, to make it uh, harder for people than it needs to be or uh, but still wants to make sure that people understand that um, kind of what it is Jesus is about um, and make sure that we understand individually ourselves what Jesus is about and try to be like that so so that's what we're about um, so I am going to try to remember what the announcements are while I'm doing this so one of the things is um, we are going to actually, uh, oh, we're back, um, false alarm, uh, a bite, but missed it. So um, our announcements. So we are, um, we're going to be getting together uh, for real um, soon. We're going to, the September, 11th, September 13th, we're going to be uh, going to the park um, in Almdale and having services there for three weeks. And then we're going to be looking at uh, doing services uh, in a uh, inside someplace, and uh, we're still trying to work that out with some municipalities. We need bigger space than our church, uh, just because of the spacing requirements for COVID and uh, all of that. But it's coming soon, so tell everybody you know that that's going to happen. Um, church in the park for three weeks, and then we're going to go from there. Uh, the other thing is we're going to be. Uh, needing help when we go inside to help with the uh, setup and the takedown and the cleaning and all that stuff. So we need people to get a hold of Margaret and let her know that we are uh, that we can do it uh, because we need that help and if we don't have that help, we really can't do it. So uh, you need to let Margaret know that. Uh, the other thing is today we are going to be hearing from John again because Steve is on vacation and uh, he is back uh, September 1st. Um, if you have any uh, pastoral needs, uh, you can contact uh, the office at, and talk to Margaret um, or you can talk to one of the elders. Um, and they're not called elders anymore, they're actually called overseers. Uh, and you can get those on our website or on the, uh, uh, in the bulletin. So uh, those essentially are my announcements. So thank you, John, for taking the service. I really enjoyed it last week. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the German fellows whose name I can't pronounce. So I'm going to go back to fishing now. And, uh, but I will be sitting and listening to the service then. So wish me luck. Bye-bye. ECC, uh, Roy Rogers here. Um, I've been asked to... Uh, give the prayers of the church so here I am we uh, we've been really missing our church family really missing that corporate worship on Sundays and uh, but we know um, and we're excited that uh, we'll be soon to be back together again um, looking forward to to uh, seeing all of you and um, and I just just reminded at how uh, how we've missed that that sense of community, that feeling of family, um, you know. And but at the same time, uh, we've been grateful for uh, like a closer relationship with our own family, and and this whole being shut in has really um, impressed upon me how how great it is um, to to have. Uh, friends and family around and um, and so today we just uh, we just want to remember what God has done for us during this time and um, and we just look forward to what he has for us in the future so let's pray dear God we just come to you in praise and thanksgiving Lord we thank you for um, our church we thank you for ECC the family there Lord, we just pray your blessing be upon each and every one. Lord, we just um, we just ask you to touch those that are listed in the bulletin. Um, 
these prayer requests, Lord, help us to remember every day to bring those to you. Lord, and we just thank you so much for, for our close family at ECC. And Lord, I just pray for those who may feel shut in right now, Lord, I pray that you will protect them. I pray that you will lead them and guide them, encourage them, give them joy. And Lord, we just look so forward to the day that we can get back together. Lord, thank you for um, Pastor Steve and Charlotte, and thank you for the message that John is bringing today. Lord, I just pray that you will bless him, lead him, and guide him, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for people like um, John who can uh, um, bring your word. Lord, we love you, and we want to serve you. Lord, bless our church at ECC. In your awesome, powerful name we pray. Amen. Good morning, ECC. Uh, so excited to worship with you this morning, and I just bless you to worship however that is for you, um, whether that is... Um, you know, singing, standing, sitting, not singing, whatever that is, I just bless you to um, just connect with God, give Him the glory, however that is for you this morning. Um, and yeah, so um, I just bless this morning to be fruitful in our worship. So um, I'm going to get right to it. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who 
Working on all my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker of a fellow Giving all to you, God Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me Working on all my own understanding Trust in that you'll 
Good morning, ECC. I trust you enjoyed the first part of this service, the worship time. And uh, yeah, it's good to be together, even if it's online. And thank you for joining us. If you don't know me, my name is John Cook. I'm part of the team here at Elmville Community Church. And we're jumping into the second week of our Focus on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a little mini-series while Steve and Charlotte are away. He's a great example of someone who sought to live his life as a believer in really hard times in the Second World War. So if you've missed the first week, last week, I'd encourage you to go back and watch that because there's a lot of information that kind of helps shed light on what we'll talk about today. This is a bit of an experiment. Uh, I'm going to have a, a, like a, a montage. We're going to have a, a couple of different scenes, different settings that hopefully will reflect the different seasons in Dietrich's life that we'll be considering. And uh, so, yeah, I hope this works out. If it doesn't, well, good news is Steve and Charlotte will be back next week. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to have some scripture reading. And right after that, you're going to find me sitting by a stream. And I hope to use this stream as a kind of an illustration to help put the context in what we'll be talking about today. So I'll pray here, and then we'll have some scriptures. Father, thank you so much for this time to gather together again. Lord, we don't take for granted the privilege of learning about Jesus, of learning about people who've set an example and an encouragement of faith. Lord, I pray for each person that's tuned in today. I pray, Father, for your spirit to bless them and enlighten them. And that you, Lord God, will bring us along in our journey with you. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have some scriptures, and then I'll see you by the creek. The first scripture reading is John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Second reading, John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Third scripture reading, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Fourth and final scripture reading, Ephesians 5, 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. I'd like to see how does that look 
in dark times. I mean, the Second World War was a very dark time. What does it mean to have the light of the world in you and shining through you in dark times? So Jesus, when he said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, did not mean that we, we might that we won't go through dark times, but it meant that even in the midst of an outwardly physical dark time, we will have the light of Jesus Christ within us. And we'll see that today. I'd like that kind of to be the, the overall uh, perspective that we look at this life of, of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So just to start us today, um, again, we, we kind of we left off last week where Dietrich had you know, he'd, he'd been exposed in New York City, and that was in 1929-ish, 1930. He went back to Europe, and as the rise of Hitler and, and Nazism came into power in the early 30s, 33, um, Dietrich was very troubled by this. And even though the, the established church embraced Hitler, because it, he seemed like a good thing at the time, like, you know, in hindsight, it's easy for us to see. But at the time, he looked like someone who was bringing morality back, order back, uh, helping the economy, and seemed like a good thing. But Dietrich um, stood against uh, the rise of Nazism and actually began to lose his own freedom as far as his ability to speak and teach as the 30s went on. And not just Dietrich, but his whole family, like his parents and his brothers. And um, so by the time 19... 39 came, Dietrich found himself back in New York. And this is kind of where we left off last week, where he was in New York. He was had the opportunity basically to sit out the war in New York City. He had ministry opportunities. He had connections and friends who, who saw this as a real opportunity for him to, to minister and help kind of from the outside. And then after the war was over, to be able to go back into Germany and rebuild the church. But Dietrich was only in New York City in, for 26 days. And he felt he needed to go back into the fire, as it were. Similar to the Apostle Paul, where the Apostle Paul was drawn back to Jerusalem, even though he knew that arrest and, and hardship awaited him. Well, Dietrich went back in 1939 to Germany with that same kind of understanding. And he felt that's where he needed to be. So we're going to pick it up here. And I want, I want you, this is where the stream comes in. Okay, this is where we're going to try to tie this in. Eugene Peterson, who is a, a great writer and theologian and pastor, used to be, um, it's passed away now, but he, he wrote this thought. He said, much of what we experience in our lives, we enter into. And it was in the context of him talking about us using our own initiative and our own willpower and our own choice. But he's making the point that, he says, that, that we, we come into things that are already established. In other words, like when we're born, we, we don't have any choice as to what family we're born into or our race or our, 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 our body, like are we male or female or are we tall or short? We, we don't have any choice in that. We enter into things that are already existing. We enter into our culture. We enter into the things that are already established for us, even our early education and our upbringing. All of those things we enter into and we make choices on a micro level. We make choices like in, in, as we go through life. But in the large picture, we enter into what's already established. And this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer experienced when he went back to Europe in 1939. He entered into a scenario that was way bigger than him that was already on the move. And, and it's, it's like this stream. I don't know how well you can see it, but the water's flowing down this way, and there's sticks, and there's all kinds of things in that in that stream. And life is a lot like that, in that we are all flowing in the current of life, in our culture, as we live here in Canada, in Ontario, uh, in 2020, with COVID and all these things. These are things that we've entered into. We didn't choose COVID. We didn't choose a lot of these things, but we find ourselves being carried along in a current. And, you know... It's like, it's like floating down the river. You know, when you're floating down a river and you've got someone beside you, it seems like you're kind of standing still because the person beside you is floating at the same pace. And yet, you're all flowing to a certain destination. And the only way to change that is to swim against the current. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, the beginning of verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, 
He says, in view of God's mercy, he says, I, I, I challenge you, offer your lives as a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you would be able to test and approve what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. And really, that's just what we want to talk about today, is the challenge as Christ followers who, are, who want to walk in discipleship. We're, we're moving along in our culture, just like Dietrich Bonhoeffer back in the Second World War. There was something he entered into. We also are being, we're, we're, it's like we're going down the stream. And Paul is saying, he's saying, okay, don't just float along with just the current of the culture. Don't just float along with the stream, but rather make sure that you, you give yourself to Christ as a sacrifice and let your mind be renewed by the, by the, by the word of God. So the idea is, is Paul's saying, look, there's like this current, right? And it's carrying us all along. And you can just float along and just take the mantra of the culture and just let it soak into you and not really wrestle with it. And it feels like, oh yeah, everything's good. Or you can say, you know what? As someone who seeks to follow Christ, I'm going to be swimming upstream, as it were. I'm going to be kind of going against the current. And, and, and what that looks like is renewing what we put in our mind and thinking differently than just the current culture. No pun intended, although it is a good pun. So the, I want you to kind of picture that. And, and this is what we're going to be seeing in Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He comes back in Europe. So in New York City, it's, they're not at war, but in Europe, the war has already begun and there's this current, there's this cultural current. And he has to choose, is he going to just flow with the current or is he going to swim against the current? And this is really just, a, 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 we're looking at Dietrich as he, as he seeks to swim against the current as best he knows how, as God shows him. And this is what Paul talks about. So that we can learn to test and approve what God's perfect will is. What does it mean to have the light of God inside of you in the midst of a culture that's flowing a certain way? Because whether or not we want to accept it, there's no standing still. You're either, you're either swimming against the current or you're being carried along with the current. Sometimes we think, well, I'll just, I just won't do anything. Well, not doing anything is like being carried along in the current. By, na by nature, you're, you're, you're flowing along. So it's in this context that Dietrich goes back and he's now back in Germany. And he's a little bit of a marked person because before he went to uh, back to New York, he'd already been involved. He'd been talking kind of anti-Nazi talk. He'd been discipling Christians and he'd been getting shut down. It was almost like a cat and mouse game where, where the authorities were kind of always trying to shut him down and they wouldn't let him preach. And they, they said, you can't, you know, you, you can't, you can't disseminate your information. So he kind of went underground. So he goes back to Germany. And his family lives, his parents live in Berlin, the central kind of the hub of, of all power in Germany. And he gets like this, this ministry charge, this like little church, pastoral church, kind of out in the boonies. And so he, he's going back and forth between Berlin to see his family and out in the, out in the boonies, for lack of a word, but away. So he's kind of out of sight sometimes. And this gives him time to reflect on what's happening. His brother, he has a brother and a brother-in-law who are involved in the German intelligence, okay? And because of that, they, again, his whole family were, were basically anti-Nazi right from the rise of Hitler back in the early 30s. They saw this was a bad thing. And so, um, so Dietrich was kind of immersed in, in that, that culture of concern about what, where the culture was flowing. And it's almost his whole family was swimming against the current. So he has his brother-in-law and his brother who are working for German intelligence. And um, to get the context, you have to think, you know how in the United States they've got like the FBI, they've got the CIA, they've got the Secret Service. All of these organizations are working kind of for the government administration, but they're all kind of independent and kind of, you know, do their own thing, as far as I know. Um, what was similar to that in Europe at... At the, at the late 30s, so you had the Gestapo. So the Gestapo was connected with the SS. They were part of the Nazi party, right? Well, there was a lot of Germans who were not Nazis. The Nazi, Nazism was a political party who had taken over, but there was a lot of Germans who were not Nazis. 
the Bonhoeffer family, they were not Nazis. And so the Bonhoeffer, two, two of Dietrich, like his brother-in-law and his brother, they were working for the German secret service, which was different than the Gestapo. And they were, they were under the covering, but they had some freedom there, right? And so Dietrich was learning very early on, like when he went back, after Hitler took Poland, he learned very early on of the atrocities that the Nazis were perpetrating in Poland and also in against Germany. Because as soon as, as soon as, uh, as Hitler invaded Poland, he also began a cleansing of the German population. Anyone who was like um, mentally handicapped or deformed, they began to slowly do like an, an, a genocide, for lack of a better word. And Dietrich was informed about these things because of his connections through his family to this to the German intelligence. So he found himself in a situation where he had this knowledge and he found himself having to be quiet and hold it in. Like he couldn't tell his like his people that he would rub shoulders with. He couldn't tell them what he knew. And he realized he was already part of a conspiracy because he had this information. And as soon as he had the information, he had to choose. Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to the authorities, to, to the Nazis, to the Gestapo and say, hey, these guys are actually working against you? Or am I going to keep it a secret? Because these were his family members who he, he, he agreed with. And, and so he began to realize almost by osmosis that he was becoming part of a conspiracy against Nazism, against Hitler. And, and he, as time went on, and he began to see more and more of the atrocities, he became more and more convinced that this was the right thing to do, was to oppose this government which was destroying Germany, destroying Europe, and destroying life as they knew it. So Dietrich, although he was a great believer in the Sermon on the Mount and the peace teaching to Jesus, he soon came to the conclusion that although it was wrong to, uh, or you, you could argue that it was wrong to go against the government that's in authority over you, it was wrong to plot well, Dietrich wasn't actually physically actively involved in a plot to take Hitler out, but he was knowledgeable of it, and he was actually in kind of like um he was in the confidence of people, and people would come to him and ask him, "What do you think?" Right? And he's like, "Well, you know." So he kind of was drawn, and he was in the he was in the inner circle, and so as he began to become more convicted that it would be more wrong. It would be more wrong to do nothing. It would be more wrong. So here's this picture of the stream again, okay? Here's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The stream is flowing this way. The, the general populace who don't know all the facts the way the Bonhoeffers did and also the, the general population who, who want this sort of thing were being swept along. And Dietrich had to say, okay, am I going to swim upstream on this? Or am I just going to do nothing? And in doing nothing, I'm just carried along. I'm actually part of the problem. See, this is the challenge we have as Christ followers in the 20th century, 20, or 2020, is that um, sometimes when we see things which we are convicted are wrong, we say, well, I'll just say nothing. Well, saying nothing and doing nothing is really part of the problem. You're, you're, really being, you're actually being carried along. It's either swim against the stream or be, or be carried along. There's like no middle ground. Now, that doesn't mean that you're militant and you're... Um, you're you're out to fight every battle, but it it is a principle that before God we need to understand that we are called to be the light of the world. And what does that mean to be the light of the world? So Dietrich is finding himself more and more involved with this group of people who are working against Nazism, and he actually gets enlisted into the into the German secret service himself through his brother-in-law. And at first, the the authorities and the Nazis are like, what? Wow, we know this guy speaks it against Hitler. What's he doing in the Secret Service? But they said, well, hey, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a lot of contacts internationally, and he's actually getting information for us. And because they were in the Secret Service, or the German, sorry, the German intelligence, they were separate from the Gestapo, and so they had a little bit of leeway. Dietrich's main responsibility working with German intelligence was to connect with his contacts in Switzerland and in England to try and convince them that there were Germans who were anti 
Hitler. There was a German resistance. This is one of the tragedies. There was many tragedies in the Second World War. But this was one of the tragedies was that Churchill and the Allies really did not want to believe that there was Germans who were resisting Nazism. They got into the place, and as the war dra dragged on, that they kind of lumped, if you're a German, you're automatically a Nazi. In other words, there's only good German is a, is a dead German. And so Dietrich's challenge was to communicate through his connections that he had in England through Bishop Bell and these different people to Churchill to say, hey, there are Germans working in Germany against Hitler. They want to take down Hitler. The challenge was, if Hitler's eliminated, well, who'd run the country, right? And they were concerned that 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 the that the Allies and that England and also Russia would come in and just parcel up Germany merciless, mercilessly. And again, as the war went on, that got even worse. So Dietrich's challenge was that was that was really his task. He would travel to Switzerland and to uh, England and stuff on behalf, supposedly supposedly gathering information for the Germans, but really what he was trying to do was build relationship and say, hey, we're working against Hitler. We're, can you help us take Hitler down? So he wasn't actively in the planning of assassination, but he was, he was actively in trying to bring support as far as internationally. The other things that he got involved in was uh, smuggling uh, Jews out of Germany. There was a group of Jews who he actually was able to smuggle into Switzerland, which was unusual because Switzerland was a neutral country and uh, they normally didn't take Jews. But anyway, he had connections and he was able to, to smuggle some Jews into Switzerland to safety. What eventually happened, though, was the Gestapo did eventually find that trail and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was imprisoned. Not because he was involved in uh, planning assassinations, but because a, he was implicated in smuggling Jews out of Germany. So Dietrich finds himself in prison. And as he's in prison, he begins to continue to write and minister to everyone around him. And it's fascinating because there's many um, accounts of people who survived the prison years and who knew Dietrich and how he was a powerful light in the darkness to the people in his cells and even to the prison guards. There was one prison guard that was so impacted by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the light of Christ in Dietrich that he actually arranged a prison escape for Dietrich. He had, he had, he had extra clothes, like guards' clothes, and he had food. And he had it all set up where Dietrich could escape. And Dietrich refused. He said, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the reprisal against my, my family, and he chose to stay in jail. He chose to face his accusers. We now have a lot of very, very valuable insights on theology and also the experiences of an insider in the Second World War because of the letters that Dietrich wrote in prison. He had become engaged to a young woman, Maria, and... Um, he really hadn't seen her much before their engagement. And then about three three days or so or a week after he got engaged, he got thrown in prison. So here he's engaged and he hasn't really spent any time with his fiancée. But the interesting thing is because he has a fiancée, she is allowed to visit him. He wasn't allowed to have other visitors, but they allowed his fiancée to come in and visit him. And they became able to interact and transfer information in and out. And... That was how their relationship was. They were this engaged couple, but they basically only saw each other when he was in jail. One of the last times that Maria saw Dietrich, they were, again, picture this. They're sitting in, in prison and they're visiting. And of course, you know, the, the guards are around and so they have to sit on either side of the table. They're exchanging information. Dietrich had this code that he used to write letters in and the code actually meant different things depending on what he wrote. And, uh, and she would bring information in and out. And at the last, when the interview was over, they got up and she rushed Dietrich. And she hugged him and kissed him. And of course, the, the guards came over and broke them up and everything. But such a heart-rending picture. And here's this woman. She lost her brother. She lost her father. And now her fiancé. She's going to lose him too. Incredible hardship, heartbreak in, in these times. And yet the light of Christ... Is shining in the midst of this. Well, we've changed settings. 
Instead of being outside in the spacious sunshine and nature, we're now inside a prison cell. Not really a prison cell, but this is as close as I could get. To visualize the idea of being closed in, you know, things are getting darker, the times are getting darker. And even though the light of Christ is shining in Dietrich, he is aware that the chances of him surviving this whole ordeal are getting less and less. The last, well, one of the last attempts on Hitler's life called Valkyrie um, had failed. And Hitler, in a rage, had mobilized everything he could to find out not just those who were directly involved, but farther and farther out, anyone who had any connections. And as the Gestapo did their thing, they eventually found connections to Dietrich. His name and his connection to these people came up. And once that happened, Dietrich pretty well knew the writing was on the wall that he was going to be executed. And um, it was, it, again, a time in his life where he continued to maintain his, his testimony. He continued to write. And he wrote several poems. And I'd like to read one poem which reflects probably the most intimate look at his, what was going on inside of him in these days. And the reason why I want to read this, I think this is really important is sometimes we look at these people from history or even scriptures and we think, you know what, I could never be like that. They were like, they were so, they had it so together. They were almost like superhuman. And it's really important for us to understand these were just human beings. Yes, Dietrich, he was smart for sure. and had all these things, but he was just a man. And he was grappling with heartbreak because of his fiancee. He was grappling with disappointment question God, did I do the right thing? And all these things as he's in prison. Some of John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist, like he, he inaugurated Jesus. He said, this is the one. And yet when he was in prison, John the Baptist sent his followers to Jesus and said, are you really the one or should we expect someone else? He was questioning, he was struggling. These are flesh and blood people. And it's really important for us to remember that because Jesus wants his light to shine through us, not because we're perfect, but because we're, we're his. We've given ourselves to him as a living sacrifice, like we read in Romans chapter 12. So this is a poem that Dietrich wrote in prison. It's called, Who Am I? I'm going to do my best to uh, get through this. This has actually really impacted me personally, this whole journey of learning about Dietrich. Anyway, this is what he writes. Who am I? <clears throat> Who am I? They often tell me. I step out of my cell, composed, contented, and sure like a lord from his manor. Who am I? They often tell me, I speak with my jailers, frankly and familiar and firm, as though I was in command. Who am I? They also tell me that I bear the days of hardship, unconcerned, amused and proud, as like one who usually wins. Am I really what others tell me, or am I only what I myself know? Troubled, homesick, ill, like a bird in a cage, grasping for breath as though someone were strangling me, hungering for colors, for flowers, for the songs of birds, thirsting for the kinds of words for human com company, quivering with anger and despotism and petty insults, anxiously awaiting for great events, helplessly worrying about my friends far away, empty and tired of praying, of thinking, of working, exhausted and ready to fit to bid farewell to it all. Who am I, this or the other? Am I then this day, today, and the other tomorrow? Am I both at the same time in public, a hypocrite, and by myself contemptible of whining weakly? Or am I to myself like a beaten army, flying away in disorder from a defeat, who am I? Lonely questions mock me. Who I really am, you know me. I am yours, O oh God. You see, Dietrich wrestled with the same weakness that we all wrestle with. The Apostle Paul talks about in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, you know, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power is not from us, but from God. Paul talks about how we're hard-pressed but we're not crushed. 
and that whole picture. And so Dietrich was wrestling with this in prison as he understood that, yeah, his days were coming to an end. So for us today, how I want to bring this back around, and we've been reading scriptures about how Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and about how the light of God is to shine through us, and, and how that we need to commit ourselves to the Lord. The bottom line is, is that whether or not, we, we can't always judge the results at the time. You think of Jesus Christ himself. I mean, when he was crucified, it didn't seem like he'd succeeded. Right? He only had like a few followers. Here he was. He was crucified. But God's definition of success is different than ours. God's definition of success is primary. Are we found in Jesus Christ? Have we committed, like Paul says, commit yourself like a living sacrifice to God in view of his mercies? Are we found in Jesus? So God's perspective of, of success is, begins there, but it ends and us being just faithful and allowing the light of God to shine in every circumstance. You see, it's not just how you begin. And a lot of the way the world looks at things is how we begin. Like, you know, all these great fanfares, like, for example, a wedding, a big a big fanfare of wedding. And, and we were just talking in a small group last night about weddings and how I believe it's important that, yes, yeah, start the way you start is important, but you want to finish well. And Dietrich was faithful to the end and he allowed his light to shine wherever he found himself to the very end. And I'm reflecting back to the image of when we were sitting out by the, the, the creek and re reflecting back to the idea that, uh, you know, we come and much of our life, we enter into what is already established. And our responsibility is again, to commit our lives to Jesus, to be found in Christ. And to seek to let our light shine. And you know how when you're standing by a pond or a quiet water and how you take a pebble and you throw that pebble in and it ripples out and out and out. And how that little pebble causes an effect that's spread far and wide. It's important to understand that we don't live life in a fatalistic way. What I mean by that is we don't live life saying, well... Things are the way they are, and I'm just, I have no, what I decide makes no difference. What you decide makes a difference. Your decisions, although you enter into something that is already there, makes a huge difference. You affect, every decision you make will affect someone else. And like that, like going on that river, you're either swimming against, you're going with it, but you are affecting other people, your example, your influence. As I sit here, I think of my own heritage and how I have benefited from my family. And I just want to say, getting off topic of it, but sometimes the things we most take for granted are the most powerful influence in our lives. When I reflect, I think of my own parents and I think of how they influenced me. And at the time, I took them for granted. So I want to challenge you. We've looked at the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and basically we've seen someone who has sought to the best of their ability to do what they felt was right before God in their circumstance. And I don't know what circumstance you're facing today, but can I encourage you, whatever that circumstance is, to start, first of all, by laying your life before Jesus and say, Lord, I give my life to you. I give my life to you. I want to be yours. And like Dietrich Bonhoeffer you know, said in his poem, regardless of how he's tossed and he's feeling good one day and he's not so good and he's, he's strong and he's composed for this person in public, but inward he's torn. All of that stuff lays at the feet at the bottom line when Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, this I know, I am yours, Lord. Whatever I am, I am yours. I give myself to you. That's really the starting point. And this next point is to know, to say, you want to do what you can to let your light shine in whatever circumstance. And that looks like love. That doesn't look like trying to be bitter or trying to fight battles in, a, in, a, in an angry way, but it looks like the love of God being unfolded in whatever circumstance. Can I encourage you that wherever you are, whatever your situation, that just like that stone tossed into the lake ripples out, your life will make a difference. That it's not just a fatalistic predetermination, but rather your decisions 
make a difference. Can I just leave you with one scripture? And that is where Jesus says, um, again, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. So you may find yourselves with uncertainty on the outside, but you can have that light within you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And uh, yeah, I'm going to pray for a second and then just make a couple of following comments. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown your life for us in Jesus Christ, that Jesus came and he ultimately died on the cross for us. He rose again on the third day. We know that from hindsight, but at the time it seemed like a defeat. We thank you, Father, that you made the way for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would embrace that which we understand. And even though there's lots of things we don't understand, that we would trust and say, we are yours. And trust in you and your resurrection power and the light of Christ shining in us. Grant this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a couple of wrap-up comments. If you're interested, um, Tom Cruise actually was uh, in a movie called Valkyrie, and it's actually based on the true events of that assassination attempt on Hitler. It doesn't make, mention Dietrich Bonhoeffer because Dietrich was in jail, but it shows kind of the context of what they were grappling with in, at that time in history, and you may find that interesting. Bless you guys, and uh, have a wonderful week.